If you are looking to go sup touring and exploring, or sup camping, what to take can sometimes be a bit confusing. The gear you need, what's the best way to keep it dry, and what kit will help keep you safe are questions we get asked all the time. In this third part of our sup touring and exploring how-to series, we're going to guide you through what you should take to make the best of your sup touring experience. This is a pretty long video because, to be honest, there's a lot of kit to get through that you might end up taking if you go on longer or overnight camping expeditions. We've split the video into sections to allow you to easily see what you should take depending on the type of trip you're going on. For bags, head to 1 minute 15. For safety kit, head to 4 minutes 7 seconds. For food, 11 minutes 20 seconds. Camping gear, 12 minutes 50 seconds cooking gear 14 minutes 15 seconds and clothing 16 minutes 50. Whatever the type of touring you're doing you're probably going to want to take some things with you which you're going to need to keep dry and therefore you'll probably need some dry bags. There are loads of dry bag options out there that are up for the job but I'm just going to highlight what I use and why as well as some of the features to look out for that I found really help. To start with, if I'm doing some very basic sup touring, my go-to dry bag is a waste pack. There's a few of these available on the market from well-known dry bag manufacturers. I like to have a waste pack because it's really quick access to my belongings when I'm paddling. I can keep some food, a jumper, my phone or a camera with me at all times. You don't have to use a dry bag waste pack. A small 10-20 to 20 litre dry bag stuff sack works really well, but the benefit of a waste pack is that you don't have to stop paddling, sit down on your board to access things. If you get somewhere and want to do some exploring, it's also a really easy product to carry. If my trip is any more than a day out, for instance if I'm doing an overnight trip and carrying cooking equipment, food or camping gear, I tend to have a completely different setup. It's a setup that I've tested and refined over the years and I find works really well for me. I take several bags. Firstly, a 60 litre main kit bag. I use an overboard backpack dry bag so I can carry it on my back when portaging or traveling. Secondly, I take a 20 litre grab bag for quick access to safety equipment and snacks. For this, I use a seal line bag with additional carry handles and an air purge system, meaning I can close the bag up quickly and then get rid of unwanted air once it's closed and secure. Thirdly, I always take my overboard waste pack. I really like this bag because the material is super soft yet durable to allow me to pack it up and secure it once I've accessed anything in the bag. Sometimes I also have a fourth dry bag and it depends on how much I need to carry and how much portaging I will be doing on my trip. I've used an Autoleb 60 litre dry tube for this most of the time because it's durable and packs down extremely small so I can take it as an extra bag that I can use if I need to. What I always think about when sup touring is although you have lots of space on the deck to be able to carry multiple bags and a lot of stuff, you still need to be able to carry when portaging and travelling. I think about making sure I can carry all my bags and sup when portaging. It can save loads of time and hassle because leaving kit attached to your board isn't very practical. Finally, I pack all my kit in my main kit bag into dry bag liners. Not only does this give me another layer of protection from the water, but separating kit types into different colour bags makes it really easy to find the things you want without unpacking your whole setup. Now if you're going a little further than normal in your sup touring, and perhaps entering different types of water, you have to make sure that you think about the associated risks and the safety kit needed. There's loads of potential safety kit that you can buy to take with you, and what you decide to invest in is really linked to the amount of risk you want to take. But you really do need to be a responsible paddler. There is some no-brainer equipment if you're out there. Remember always wear a leash and ensure it's the right type of leash for the type of paddling you're doing. It's your lifeline to your board and in many cases will be your flotation aid. So never depart it from it. Keeping safe on your expedition is best approached via adequate planning. This will help you identify hazards and plan how you prevent them turning into instances that might compromise safety. 
You'll also be able to decide on the correct safety equipment or level of safety equipment you need through adequate planning. Being able to communicate when on your expedition is essential to prevent danger. It allows you to get updates on weather and conditions, communicate with the other members of your team or safety contacts, as well as stay in touch with other marine traffic or authorities that will help you keep safe. It also allows you to raise the alarm if things do go wrong. Nearly all of us have a smartphone these days and it's a really good piece of safety equipment that you should take with you as a bare minimum. But in some instances, it's not really enough and you might want to consider additional communication of devices such as things like VHF radios. A VHF radio is a standard tool for communicating on the water, particularly coastal waters. It will also allow you to access certain level of weather information that can be useful in some places. A VHF radio is also a really useful tool if you're sub touring in areas where there might be other marine traffic. It's the standard way for marine traffic to communicate and you'll be able to listen in for things like shipping movements and keep yourself or your group out of danger. But bear in mind, you need a license to operate a VHF in many parts of the world, so make sure you get your license if you choose to use one. I've used VHF radios to communicate with other members of my SUP touring group in areas of poor mobile signal, allowing us to safely negotiate some potentially risky situations during our expedition. You need to think about using safety equipment to prevent risky situations, giving you access to information that will help keep you safe. Mobile phones and VHF radios are also really great tools should you wish to raise the alarm if you get into trouble. But there's also some other things that you might want to consider to raise the alarm. Personal location beacons available in GPS or AAS are great if you're solo or leading an expedition. They allow you to raise the alarm to the emergency services almost immediately should you get into trouble. There's also lots of other tools that you can use, such as flares and flashlights, but bear in mind you need to have correct training to use these. If you're likely to be remote, don't forget to take a backup battery source for your phones or VHFs. These are available in loads of different size and shapes and capacities. I choose to use this relatively compact one with integrated cables for different devices because it keeps things simple. Now this is a very personal choice and there's lots of differing views on the subject. My suggestion is as paddlers we need to take responsibility for our own safety. Assess the risks of paddling we are doing before attempting it. If you are unsure, take further advice or err on the side of caution. Remember, water is very dangerous if things go wrong, so you need to think about what could go wrong and be fully prepared to deal with the situation if you ended up in the water. For my own sub touring, I have the following rules of thumb for when I wear personal flotation. When sub touring alone or at night, I always have an inflatable PFD on me such as a waist PFD or sometimes a buoyancy aid. I prefer an inflatable as it's less restrictive and warm while I'm paddling. If I'm in a group in the day, I don't wear one unless I'm going to be offshore by more than 1000 meters. In these situations, my leash keeps me connected to my sup, which is my primary flotation. The exception to this rule is if I'm paddling on a river with moving water, where I wear a PFD, non-inflatable, as I'm paddling with a quick-release leash, so could lose that primary flotation. It's worth considering what spares you might want to take with you, depending on the type of sup touring and exploring you're doing. With paddles, I consider taking a spare paddle for longer expeditions where I might be a long way from somewhere I could get one repaired or replaced. I generally use a three piece that packs down well and connect the parts together with some electrical tape so there's no risk of losing individual parts of that paddle while I'm paddling. With pumps, if you're paddling on an inflatable, consider taking a spare pump. For a day paddle, I generally don't, but if overnight I take one, an overnight trip gives just enough time for a slow leak in an ice up to start to cause a real problem. With fins, I always think about taking a spare one because loading your ice up with all this stuff puts extra strain on the fin box and the head of the fin. If I'm paddling for a long distance overnight, I take a spare fin. I use the same logic as I would if I'm choosing to take a spare paddle. 
If you're paddling in a group, not everyone needs one of these spares. If all your paddles break, it questions whether you should be out there in the first place and if you're using good enough quality gear. Coordinate spares between yourselves and your group, making sure that you have fins for all fin boxes and enough paddles to cover the different paddle lengths you might need. I take a first aid kit generally if I'm paddling on an overnight trip or if I'm in an extremely remote location. Overnight trips introduce a lot more opportunities to hurt yourself, for instance cooking burns or cutting yourself with a knife. Grab a waterproof one like this, it's a great bit of kit but understand what's in it and how to use the equipment within it. Finally, I like to make rules around safety gear. I look at the risk and make rules for when I use certain equipment. For instance, if I'm paddling alone on the coast, I'll be much more vigilant and make sure I can raise the alarm quicker. This might mean that I would carry an emergency beacon like a PLB. Look and understand the risks and develop your own rules and stick by them. I consider a lot of my experience SUP touring as well as solo yacht sailing to guide me on my decisions. If you are unsure, consider getting in touch with us via RC experts or get some formal training. My motto here is food is fuel and water is life. Take enough fuel to keep your energy levels up and enough water to keep correctly hydrated. Take easy things to snack on when you're on the board as you might not be able to get off all the time. Have a water bottle for drinking separately to a water bottle for carrying additional water. I like to take these cool concentrated squash products to make purified water taste nicer and encourage me to drink regularly. I always have a pack of purification tabs with me as well because as I said before, water is life and should you lose or contaminate your supply, these give you the option and are super lightweight and small. Just think carefully about how much water you'll need. You'll always be surprised about how much water you use cooking, cleaning and drinking when camping. Consider the temperature of the day and if it's hot, take much more drinking water than you normally would. With food, you have loads of options. The longer you're going sup touring for, the more space will be a premium and you might need to consider expedition food. These come in two key types, freeze dried or wet vacuum packed. Each have their pros and cons in terms of taste, weight and water needed. So plan what you need based on your expedition. If you are just going for one night and can't face expedition food, you should have enough room in your kit bags for cooking fresh food. But if you're paddling a long way, sometimes the last thing you want to do is prepare food when you get to your location. So expedition food isn't just for space saving, it's for convenience as well. With camp kit, there's loads of options for gear, but here's a quick run through of what you need. Shelters, you could consider tents, bivvies, tarps or hammocks. All give you various levels of shelter and comfort. The main benefits to a bivvy is it allows you to carry less gear and sleep in an extremely small space. Use a tarp to shelter from the wind or the rain. Hammocks can be a great way for a more comfortable night. Tents give you the best shelter and can be very compact if you're willing to dig deep into your wallet. I sometimes take a tent and a bivvy to give me options if space in my bags allow it. I like to be flexible with where and how I would sleep. You'll also need something to sleep on and in. You'll need a sleeping mat, again available in a variety of sizes, weights, costs and thermal properties. They're inflatable and can pack down extremely compact if you're willing to dig deep into your wallet. With sleeping bags, pick a sleeping bag with a season rating or comfort rating that fits the environment that you're going to be in. Consider a liner for adding a little bit more warmth in your bag. If you're planning on sup touring all year round, you may need different bags for different seasons. If you have room for a little luxury, you can also buy special camping pillows. It's not completely necessary as you can just use your other gear. It depends on how much space you have. If you are planning a longer or overnight trip, cooking equipment should definitely be on your list. Of course, you can go fully wild and take no cooker, cooking on fires alone. We did this in Ibiza and it was great fun and an awesome experience, but equally a lot of hard work. For expedition food, you basically just need to heat up water. So a simple lightweight camp cooker, a set of mess tins or similar pots and pans, a lighter and a spoon or fork is all you really need. I tend to always take some fire lighters with me to make the exercise of getting a fire going for some warmth later on the evening or just some adventure ambience an easier process. 
I throw in a flint lighter as a backup spark in case my lighter fails, gets wet, or I just lose it. There's lots of really affordable lightweight cookers out there that will allow you to link up to widely available gas canisters and cook using lightweight pots and pans or mess tins. You can get set up for as little as £25 or about 35 bucks. I prefer cooking on cookers that connect to the gas canister via a hose rather than the cooker connecting directly to the canister. The reason for this is it makes cooking much easier and prevents unwanted spillages when cooking on uneven ground. Right now, I love using this MSR wind burner product. For me, it ticks a lot of the boxes. It boils water extremely quickly due to the fins in the same way that a jet boil works. It's bigger, so good for catering for two, and the gas attaches via a hose, which also allows me to use an adapter for European gas. It also packs up conveniently into a unit with the bowl and the gas all in one part. For me, its slightly larger size isn't a problem for SUP touring. On SUPs, we have the ability to carry a little bit more volume on our boards compared to if you are backpacking. If you're planning a SUP touring trip abroad, you might have some other things to think about when considering cooking. How you get your fuel to your location might be a problem if you're flying because you won't be able to take your gas bottle on the plane, so you'll have to get it on location. There's also some differences between standard uses of gas bottles and attachments. For instance, in Europe, the standard gas bottle attachment for camping stoves differ from the UK, so you might need to consider buying a different cooker or finding an adapter like this UK to European gas canister converter before you go. What to wear paddling is a huge subject that we cover in many other videos and written features on Supporter and SupportermAg.com. When thinking about sup touring and exploring, the key thing to remember is that you're likely to be paddling for longer periods across various different types of conditions. So consider this when building your kit list to make sure you keep yourself healthy and safe. If weather changes during the day you're paddling, you might need extra layers, including a waterproof or windproof layers. I will generally always paddle with a waterproof jacket on or in my storage in case the temperature drops or it gets wet. When going overnight or for several days, you need to make sure that you have enough suitable clothing. I categorise equipment into paddling clothing and non-paddling clothing. I will consider extra paddling clothing if kit gets wet or has no opportunity to dry overnight, but also multiple layers so I can keep safe in various conditions and quickly change to wearing suitable clothing. My non-paddling clothing considers the fact that my shelter is limited, so I take multiple layers as well as warm down jacket and thermal hat. After a long day paddling, your body could be exhausted, low on energy and keeping warm could be harder than you would expect. So suitable clothing is key to make your evening or evenings as comfortable as possible. Make sure you check overnight temperatures as well as daytime temperatures to help you take suitable kit. As you can see, what's taken your SUP touring and exploring adventure is a very big subject. If you have any questions, drop us a comment below, or if you're a SUP Border Pro subscriber, please get in touch with us via the Ask the Experts forums. If you haven't already, check out the rest of the SUP touring and exploring series, and stay tuned for the next part where we look at how to pack your gear safely and securely onto your SUP. Also, don't forget to check out extra SUP touring and exploring video features on SUP Border Pro. If you liked the video, please give it a like, and we'll see you next time on Supporter, SupporterMag.com, and Supporter Pro.